It's time. Um, I've uh, I've edited these slides a lot because I, I haven't really been sure exactly all the things I wanted to say or in what order. Um, so it's it's probably a mess, but um, I, I think it'll be all right. So I'm going to be talking about Perl five. Um, has anyone here ever used Perl five? <laughs> has has anyone here ever uh, uh, contributed a patch to the, to the Perl five core distribution? That's a bunch. Has anybody here uh, subscribed to Perl five porters? Wow, that's even more. Has anybody here read all the messages they got on any given day of Perl five porters? Wow, wow. I use Perl four. Well, good. That's that's great. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Perl five porters. Um, but I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff going on in Perl 5, and I'm hoping that I am going to have time to take a lot of questions if you have a lot of questions. But we're going to find out as I go. And if stuff gets boring, I'm just going to stop and say I want questions. Um, so if you don't know uh, what I do, I am the pumpkin. Um, what that means is that uh, I, I'm like the project manager for Perl. Um, I make decisions if the decisions are not obvious. Um, or if they're only obvious to me. Um, I poke people to make sure releases get made, and uh, I get to stand up here and give a talk where I talk about my feelings when everybody else has to talk about software that's complicated. Um, well, I'm going to talk about complicated software, though, because I'm talking about Perl. Um, in the past, Perl has been like a big mess. Um, but these days, Perl is a, it's a big mess. Um, <laughs> but we love our Perl, right? It's, it's a mess, but it's, it's our mess. And I promise we are not going to change that. Um, we're going to leave it a nice big mess, so, so don't worry. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about mess management, which was a slide here, but now it's gone. I hope I'm not going to suffer from the Stephen Little problem with Keynote, because uh, I need my transitions. Um, I'm going to talk about what's new and why we've put stuff in, uh, where we're going, and where we won't be going, and why we won't be going there. So. The first thing of substance I want to talk about is a little micro talk uh, in the style of talks I've given in the past. Um, Perl 518. Who cares? Um, how many people here have installed Perl 518? Almost everybody. That's awesome. How many people are, are using it as like their, 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 their personal computer's Perl? Who's using Perl 518 for work? A couple people. Great. <laughs> Um, anybody using Perl 519 for their personal computer? <laughs> I, I'm using 519 on my computer. Good, there's three or four people. Anybody using 519 for work? Thank God. <laughs> um, okay, and if you upgraded to Perl 518, how many of you read the Perl Delta? All of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's because the Perl Delta is full of all these really important bug fixes, like this guy. Right, renaming packages through glob assignment in combination with the M question mark matching operator and reset no longer makes threaded builds crash. <laughs> yeah, the, Finally. the uproar of joy. Um, right, or this, this, this is not my favorite weirdo bug. This one is, if you have tied percent hat H, and then it goes on to say, like some, instead of something horrible happening, something terrible happens. Um, <laughs> If you know what this hash is and you see the word tied put with it, if you didn't weep Why a little bit, if you didn't weep a little bit, you were probably Matt Trout. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about stuff that you might actually care about. First, I'm going to talk about regex character class sets. Um, yeah, they're great. Um, regex have character sets, right, like this guy. I want to see if this has a thing from A to Z in it. But you can't really do set operations with them. Uh, except for addition, right? Addition's really easy. Um, like you can say, I want to match A to Z. Well, I want to add the 0 to 9 set. Great, that's easy. Uh, but what if you want A through Z, 0 through 9, but not 3? Three? 3 is right out, <laughs> right? You throw in a simple negative look behind assertion. Uh, I mean, it's a simple negative look behind assertion, but once you're using a negative look behind assertion, you're going downhill fast. Um, so something you can say with new, let me go back. Something you can say now is I'm going to use an extended class, right? That's with this little question mark. When you see a question mark after a parenthesis in Perl regular expressions, somebody is getting clever. But this is good clever because it's really clear clever. I want, let me go back a little more and tell you something here. We're going to pretend 
that you need this, but you need to be Unicode-y. You need to pretend that Texas is not the only country in the world. <laughs> so you want all letters plus all numbers minus anything with a numeric value of three. Right? This is going to match all the letters, all the numbers, except for Latin digit three, Malayali digit three, and you know all these, these crazy characters that people warn you about when you use backslash D. And by the way, no Cyrillic. <laughs> this, this, this looks more complicated at first. You see more squiggly bits, except you can look at it, and it's totally clear. It's totally clear what you've done. And if you have ever needed to do this kind of regular expression, which I admit is a little bit out there, you are really happy right now. Um, the only thing to note is that you'd actually have to start this off <clears throat> by saying no warnings, experimental regex sets, because right now we're still we're, we're testing the waters. So it's going to warn you, hey, you're using an experimental feature. Um, think twice. You know, just make sure you're cool with that, because we might change it next time. So we'll come back to this. Lexical subroutines are really neat. And these are one of these features that happens all the time when I put a talk together like this, where lexical subroutines are a feature that I think is pretty neat, but I don't know what I'd use it for or why I care. And I want to show everybody why it's cool, and I have to write an example, and I'm writing these examples, and it's super, super contrived. This example is still contrived, don't worry. But it's really contrived, and it's not, doesn't look useful. Um, but then as I'm doing it, I realize why it's useful, and then I'm super excited, and I'm super excited by this. Um, so we're going to use a lexical subroutine. First, we make a normal subroutine called sum. As you may guess, this is going to add two numbers. So we get the first number. And then, whoa, <laughs> we're making a lexical subroutine. It has the same scope as any other lexical, right? It's only visible inside of this block. And we're going to take uh, another argument. We're going to add it to x. And then we're going to call that lexical subroutine with our arguments. Uh, yeah, with the argument that is left on the stack. As you, all of you having read higher order Perl, right, you all know this is a closure. And that lexical subroutine has closed over the x. So <clears throat> let's get, we're all on the same page. What's this going to return? Three. Three. How about this? Five. Four. Five. And the next one? Seven. And the reason that it's, uh, that it's five and not four is that that lexical gets rebuilt every time you call it. It's just like a normal lexical, right? It goes away at the end of scope. It's garbage collected, basically. <clears throat> so everybody get this, right? This is kind of cool. I mean, this is my super contrived example. Um, this is to show you the, the basics. Something else you can do, if you, or if you, like me, are still running a lot of 5.8, you may have forgotten about a feature we added six years ago. You can say this. So now you build a subroutine once, and it sticks around there. So that's, that's good. That shouldn't have a, a wah. But Uri, what's, that, what's the next one? Four. 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 Why is it four? Because we really closed over x the first time. Yes, because now we've closed over the x the first time, and we don't rebuild that sub. This is useful if you want to build up a callback only if you need it, but then never build it up again. Like you could be using state dollar sub equals sub, right, an anonymous one. This one lets you call things by name so your code doesn't have all these dollar foo arrow parens. So the question is, why do I really want to use this? Because in five, I don't know, five oh something, you could have already built normal closures uh, and called them. And it's a little goofy to look at, but it's Perl, right? Everything's a little goofy to look at. Uri. I got a, I got a non-contrived example next. Okay, fine. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write this, I'm writing a test file. Who writes tests? Yay, okay. I'm gonna write a test file, and in my test file, I write some routine that prints out diagnostics based on, I don't know, stuff, right? And I'm gonna use this all over my program. But uh, because I like factoring stuff into tiny little pieces so no one else knows how to work on it, I'm gonna put all the parts of my, it's really true. I'm going, to put, I'm going to put all the parts of my test into their sub packages. By the way, package name block is um, my second favorite feature from 5.14. I love it. Um, so we're going to have some subroutine in there that's going to like do some work when you say test stuff, and then it's going to do a diagnostic. And we're going to have another one where the helper is going to like, do some stuff, and then it's going to do a diagnostic. But what's the problem here? The, 
Sorry? It won't find Diag. Because Diag was defined up in main, and these guys are calling it from these things. But that's lexical. Lexical scope transcends the boundaries of packages. You can find that everywhere. Right? So this is pretty sweet for tests. There's only one little problem, which is, uh, which is this. <laughs> Whoops. Um, we'll, we'll fix that um, eventually. But, but this is where it got cool, right? You don't need to use lexical subroutine for this, because there's no reason it has to be private or go away. What you wanted was the ability to transcend package values, package boundaries, with a lexical name. How do you get a lexical name on a package variable? Our. Our sub. Now this is a totally normal package subroutine with a lexically available name in, in all lower scopes. Awesome. I'm going to start using that like as soon as it doesn't segfold. Um, <laughs> it, it works. It does work as long as you're not detracing. Um, so, you know, I haven't really learned detrace, so I'll probably start using it right now. Um, I don't know why I have this slide again. Oh, because you can't write this. You have to write this. And if you do that, you will still have to do this. Yeah, you have to do it twice. Let's not get into it. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, it should say no expansion. Okay. Um, it should say lexical subs twice and not regex sets. Um, this feature is still clearly under development because it does stuff like segfault and show unknown in your stack traces and other really cool stuff. Um, if you want to find cool bugs, find bugs in this and then fix them. I will give you a nickel for each one. Um, not you. Um, <clears throat> experimental features, right. So why are these things experimental features? Um, we've made experimental features because if you've got your laptop in front of you, run Perl, especially if you're on 5.18, it's better. Run Perl doc, Perl experiment. And it tells you all the features that are experimental in Perl. Things like weak references, and iThreads, and attributes, like stuff that are used all over the place. And how do you know it's experimental? Well, until this last release, you basically didn't. Or you like went and you did a bunch of research and you found this out. So people would use these features. And if it's experimental, doesn't that mean that we're not sure if it's good? We might change it, we might rip it out. Yeah, but we can't take out attributes. Who here uses Catalyst? Yeah, how would you like it if all your code broke? <laughs> no, right, so, what's that? It would be worth it. It would be worth it, well, so, um, so we want to we wanna make it clear, these things are experimental. We still want experiments, experiments are awesome. But we want to let you know, okay, like here there are dragons. And if you like dragons, that's cool. But like they might change later and start breathing something you weren't expecting. And, and you need to acknowledge that by saying no warning. So we've got some other experimental features going on, like lexical topic. Um, so lexical topic is, right, so, oops. Okay, here's a subroutine. Um, of the four statements, after pulling in the topic, uh, which of those statements can refer to the contents of dollar underscore? All of them. How about here? Three of them? Okay, um, so the answer is, it depends on how reset stood out was defined. If you wrote this, then it's three of them. Right, you can't see it and resets it out. If you wrote this, then you can see the content of your caller's dollar underscore, but only in dollar underscore bracket zero. It becomes an argument. Okay, so like you got to learn something. A learning something's okay. I like learning something every couple of months. Um, but see, so right, you write this. Um, in both cases, in these dollar underscore depends on the environment where it was where it was declared. And in the second case, the topic that was in force when it was called goes into the stack. Don't worry about it. The reason that this is a problem, beyond the fact that it's weird, who uses TryTiny? Yes! Wow, that's actually really good. I didn't expect that. Um, TryTiny is, is really nice. Um, <clears throat> You can do a try, and this is just a subroutine. It does, you, they, you can leave out the word sub, but 
But those two squiggly braces, those are enclosing subroutines. And if the first thing dies, which it very well might, given this code, um, then the second subroutine is called with the exception in the topic. So what's going to happen here? Um, is it going to die? Is this code really going to die? Well, no, because that's the end of file. But thank you for playing. Um, <laughs> right, the, tri the try block will die. It'll go into the catch block. The catch block will match uh, ignore against that, and it won't die. It successfully caught the exception. Until somebody 7,000 lines higher in this program adds this guy. Because now that second subroutine is a closure over the lexical topic. Awesome. Um, so you have to write it like this. Right? No, no one wants to write this. That's okay, there's another way. If this doesn't look good, you don't like having to put, you see the prototype I put in? If you don't want to have to put in sub in a prototype, you could write this. <laughs> right, so we're not sure, like the lexical topic, it seemed like a really good idea because lexical stuff is good. Um, but Perl 5 has a lot of expectations of certain globals, including the topic, and we've subverted those expectations and made people really, really unhappy by doing it. Speaking of making people unhappy. Um, no, I don't want to talk about it. Um, smart match has been a, a big point of contention, and I don't want to say anything more about it than that. In general, everyone is happy with some part of smart match, and nobody's happy with the whole thing. So what we've done is we've said, we know it has to change somehow, and the change needs to get done. Maybe it's, maybe it's fixing stuff uh, probably to work like this. Memorize this. This slide won't be up long. Um, and maybe it's to rip the feature out. We're not sure, but now it's experimental. If you use these features, you get a warning. Who has encountered this? Very few people, OK. Um, who has who's been unable to install something because of no warnings tests? Yeah, OK, same people. In fact, I think it was exactly the same people. Um, but we need these things. We need to be able to mark our experiments as these are things that we don't know what's going to happen. Please be careful, because we don't want to get stuck in this. We have to be backwards compatible to people who've been using this feature since 1997 when it was introduced as an experiment with a comment, please don't ever use this. Um, you know, that comment was in a Perl Delta, and when I install Perl 5.16, I don't go and read Perl 5.006 Delta, or 5.005 Delta, or wherever these things come in. Uh, this is especially bad. Uh, this slide is out of place, so we're going to skip it. But nice ellipses, right? Um, how did this slide get over here? Right, so the point here was, if you, were, if you were putting a, a try catch inside your given when, it's implicitly lexicalized your topic and your catch is a, is a closure again. That's all. Isn't that great? OK. More stuff. Hash randomization. Everybody knows that this program is going to print out the same stuff over and over. right? Because hashes go in the same order if they've got the same stuff. Some people make this argument. But it's, it's not really ever been true. We're really lucky, for this example, that these things happen to come out this way. And in fact, in Perl 5.16 and earlier, they very often will come out this way. But if you pick slightly different values, this is Perl 5.16 or 5.14 I'm running here, stuff is different. When, when do you encounter these differences? Really, really rarely. Um, not, not like never. But it'll happen once in a while. And when does it happen? Well, it happens based on what keys are in your hash. So like, sometimes your hash will come out in different order. And you're, you will search for this bug. And you will search and search and search. And you will never find it because you won't have the same user input. So <clears throat> the key to understand here, this is the promise we make. And for reals, this is the promise we keep. The stuff you get out of keys and values and the order of each goes in the same order from a single hash variable every time unless you change it. The reason I'm telling you what we've always done is that in 5.18, it's going to change all the time. Like, you do anything with any kind of hashes that are a little different, you touch them, they just change like crazy. And this is really good, because that bug that you spent like three weeks debugging and never found the answer to, you're going to find that bug every time you run your program, because it's different every time. Um, who uses this feature? Yes, no one, I'm sorry, Damien couldn't be here this year. Um, <clears throat> these are really, really crazy ways of embedding uh, Perl code inside your regular expressions. They're very cool. Um, they work now. Um, they, they didn't. They, if you like, had a 
a, a string that had a brace in it, your Perl would seg fault. It was sweet. Um, we, we, we seg fault Perl differently now. Um, split. This is for all the awk fans. If you have done this in the past, you split with a literal string, it acts like awk. If you split with a scalar containing a literal string, it splits like Perl. Who thinks this is awesome? Some people. Yeah, well, get bent. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's been fixed. Um, Which way is it fixed. It's fixed by they both work like the top one. If the first argument, if the first argument to split evaluates to a single space character, it works like awk. Um, the ways in which it was broken subtly before are awesome, but I don't have time. If you ask me later, I'll try and show you some cool examples. Okay, uh, stuff is leaving. I, I, we had our fond farewell to CGI PM, uh, which, which Perrin I really appreciated. I thought that, uh, that CGI PM is also, for me, was really important. And we are getting rid of some other stuff of differing amounts of importance to me. Um, leaving the core, these guys. Um, they have all been marked as going soon, and in Perl 519, they are gone from the core. They are still on CPAN, totally still install them, you can use them. I have no, I have nothing to say about the quality of these, you know, it's not my, my job. Um, I don't think that they're all bad modules, um, but they are leaving the core, because we are trying to get the maintenance burden on the core really low. Okay, that's everything I think I have to say about 518. I have 25 minutes, that's not bad, any questions? Yes. Regex grant. Who knows about regex grammars? A lot of people. That's good. Regex grammars is a really, really cool module. Um, and I'm going to grossly oversimplify by saying what it lets you do is write something that looks a lot like a Perl six grammar, uh, at least compared to a regular expression, and it turns into a regular expression which you can then use like a grammar in Perl. Really, really cool. And it was broken by that work on the embedded Perl in regex. And originally it was broken irrevocably. There were some really nasty little bugs stuck in there. And it is now revocably broken. Um, but someone needs to revoke it. So it needs to be fixed. Um, and if anyone would like to send Damien a patch, um, I'm sure Damien would be happy to receive it. He will throw you across the room. I, I don't know how Damien shows his thanks. Um, but uh, yeah, seriously, if, if somebody here uses it and wants to fix it under 5.18, that would, be, that would be super. There are not a lot of modules that are really broken under 5.18. Uh, some of them have their test suites fail for uninteresting reasons, but, but Regex Grammar is a cool module that is broken under 5.18 because of serious bug fixing. Anybody else about 5.18? Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. I, I, it's always nice to hear, but um, I actually do very little, um, which is also really nice, and I, I may talk about that in a little bit. Um, the amount of work I have to do is pretty low, which is, which is nice. We've gotten into a good rhythm of getting these things out, uh, which is the only reason I would be standing here. If I had to do the kind of stuff that pumpkins in the past have done, I would still be eating tacos right now and not talking about what I've been doing here. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about Pearl 5 in general. Uh, I think we established many people here have used Perl 5. Um, uh, and who here has, has heard talk about Perl 5 being stuck or stagnant or blocked or anything like this? Right. So who has heard that we need to like rebrand Perl 5 and change what it is? Right. So we've been talking a lot about how are we going to rebrand new logos, new names. Uh, this has been suggested by a lot of people, the new Perl 5. Um, <laughs> Uh, some people have suggested that, you know, what we want is really just, it's, you know, there are people who established this pattern already. We have something good. We want to make some small modifications and offer a new product. Um, <laughs> I like this one because really, um, I think that what we want to do uh, to make things go smoothly is to have a lot of Perl 5s. Um, Liz gave a talk, I think yesterday, um, about all the different Perls we have. Languages that claim to be Perl, um, like Perl 5. I'm not saying they're, 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 they're lying and saying they're Perl. No, per, like Perl 5, it says I'm a Perl. Um, Mo, I think, says it's a Perl, right? Yes. Sure, thank you. Thank you, someone. <laughs> um, and, and other one, P2 is a Perl. Um, Ruby is maybe a Perl. Um, 
or at one point might have said that. Um, but what we don't have people talking about much are other Perl 5s. Um, or if they do, I think they're using the term in a very loose sense. So another proposal that's been made is talking about pumpkin, pumpkin Perl. And the point here is there are many Perl 5s. I mean, there aren't, right? There's one. There's one Perl 5. But, but, but there's many Perl 5s. And ours is pumpkin Perl. This, is, this has been said. There's something I really like about this, this proposal, and it's not just the look on this pumpkin's face, which is just adorable. Um, it's that if we have pumpkin Perl, and it's like, yeah, we have Perl 5. It's pumpkin Perl. That's the one I run. Um, we can start with that. And somebody else can say, I want to make some changes. I want to do some crazy stuff. But I'm not going to write my own Perl from scratch. Uh, the people who are doing this, like, cool. <laughs> I'm, I hope everybody learns something awesome. I hope these things go somewhere and produce value for humanity. I could not possibly think of enduring the suffering of saying, I'm going to implement a new language, and it's going to be a Perl. Like, holy cow. No, I'm going to start. Like, I'm going to start with this guy, and I'm going to make some changes, and I'm going to make Hubbard, right? And it's some other Perl that's weird in some other ways. It's, it's good for things other than just Pi, because um, Perl Pi is great. Um, and somebody else can say, well, I'm going to make different changes, because I want to break Perl, too. I want to do things in Perl that if I shipped in a stable Perl release, um, the sysadmins of the world would come and have my head. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release my other fork. And my favorite, and I will donate something to anybody who starts and delivers something significant on a pearl called turban. This is a, this is a turban squash. Um, I don't just love it because of the name. I, love, I, I like it because of the name. Um, but having something like turban, turban pearl is like having an experimental feature. It's a way of saying, we're doing something weird over here. Um, and maybe you're going to say, we're doing something weird, but we're sticking to it. It's not going to change. But from the perspective of me using the pearl.org pearl, um, it's saying we're, we're going to really change stuff. And you have, to, you have to read our whole delta, because our delta is going to tell you things that are going to break some amount of code. You start with Perl, and then you break it, and then you see how much you broke and how much you win. Right? Like We broke 400 CPAN modules, or 3,000 CPAN modules, or, or however you want to measure what you broke. And you see, but it's way better because something. Right, like it's faster, or you can do something really cool with packages, or you can get a much better meta object uh, system built into it, whatever. And then, if it turns out that the breakage is pretty small and the win is huge, I can steal your work. And we can, we can bring it back into Perl 5, um, which is great. Um, so when people want to talk about what is the future of Perl 5, the future of Perl 5 is Perl 5. Um, it's not going to go anywhere. We're not going to. We're not going to break Perl. It's going to stay Perl. Um, so what, what is Perl? Um, Perl should get more Perlish. That's how Perl should be changing. I think. Uh, what does that mean, right? Well, Perl. Perl is a, a made. It's a whole that is made of parts that all work really nicely together. Um, <clears throat> the things that I think make it Perl are that Perl is teachable. I think Perl is actually very easy to teach. Um, it's guessable if you know, if you're an existing Perl programmer and you want to figure out how something is going to work that you're looking at, you can guess. And you're, you're pretty often right. 50% and maybe better, I think. Uh, but, but sure, 50% is not bad. Um, it's extensible, right? If you're frustrated with the limits of Perl, you can, you can do more with it. And it's compatible. Um, it's compatible for someone who wants to upgrade. They can upgrade with confidence that everything is not going to go nuts. And then. Um, yeah, I did it. I mentioned back and pat, right? Oh, snap, back and pat. Um, <clears throat> this is where people start to like grit their teeth, because why do we have to be backwards compatible? Backwards compatible is like the worst thing ever. Backwards compatibility is holding us back. We should break horrible old features to allow evolution, or we don't make change because we need back and pat, and this is really, really bad. The, 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 the maxim that I've come to, to accept the more I work on Perl and other projects is that success hates agility. Right? These two things are opposites. If your project is really successful and has a lot of users, the more you change it, the more users you will lose because they can't keep using your product. Uh, they can't upgrade. And if their choice is, well, I can upgrade and everything breaks, or I can stay on the version I've got, they'll stay on the version they've got. You know, like lexical subroutines are cool. 
but I'm not going to break my business to get lexical subroutines. I'm not going to break all that code there. Um, and everybody knows that we need to break some things, right? Like that's how you fix bugs. Well, like a bug, somebody's going to call that a feature. You, do you have to fix it or not? I don't know. Um, right, this is the, a good famous Larry Wall quote. We all agree on the necessity of compromise. We just can't agree when it's necessary to compromise, um, which can also be formulated like this. Um, we all agree we should remove cruft, but we can't agree on what cruft to remove. Um, what are we going to take out of Perl? Are we going to take out uh, prototypes and break everything? Are we going to take out ties yes. and break everything? <laughs> uh, or like, are we going to take out something smaller? Are we going to take out um, the implicit Latin one-ism of strings under certain operating conditions and break, I don't know how much, right? People all wanted things to change. But the question of what they want to change and how much they're willing to break is very, very different. And I I've, have established uh, an idea of how much we can break and what we're going to change in the Perl that I'm managing. And once we have Turbine Perl, people can make different decisions. And we can see how that goes. And the nice thing, I think, will be to see what in what direction they evolve. And the coolest thing is that if somebody forks Perl, and starts making a few small changes that break some amount of stuff and have some amount of benefit, and everyone wants to use that one, then that can be the pearl that everybody uses. Um, forking, GitHub taught us this, right? Forking is awesome. Um, we fork each other's code, we play with it, we see how it works, we share it back to each other. That's the way this stuff should work. So the, on, on the question of BackCompat and how it's holding us back, BackCompat has prevented very, very few patches from landing in the last few years. Before that, I can't speak to. But uh, as long as I've been watching the list closely, the number of things that haven't changed when we got a patch because of BackCompat is exceedingly low. Um, people don't supply patches, and then we say no. Um, how many patches have not been written because of BackCompat concerns? We don't know because we don't get these reports. Sometimes someone will say, I want to write a patch. Will you accept this? Sometimes we'll say, well, no, that's just going to break too much stuff. It's not within our, with our, our guaranteed service level. It's called our service level agreement with the users of Perl. Um, but I think I get the impression there are a lot of people who say that Perl is being blocked by back and pack concerns with very little hard evidence that it's true. Uh, I think there's a lot of assumptions being made about what happens on the discussion list without a lot of experience about what really happened. So how many patches right, have been discussed on the list until they don't happen. All right, how many have been talked to death? Some. Some. Um, why do things get talked to death? There's a couple reasons. This is the best reason. Sometimes we figure out that it was a bad idea. Right? Like, I've got this cool idea for a feature, and maybe even here's a patch to implement it. Can we do this? And like, brrr, the, the mail starts coming in. And, and after discussion, which is usually civil, technical, interesting discussion, sometimes too, sometimes a lot of it. And those of you who read every message know this. There's a lot of it. In general, I think it's actually quite good. Sometimes we find out, yeah, you know what? This wasn't a good idea. That's a good kind of talk to death. Sometimes we get people who are like, yes, well, that feature seems pretty cool, but shouldn't we also, I don't know, you know? This is, this is the congressional amendment uh, syndrome. Like, I really like your idea to make for loops faster, but shouldn't we also have a postfix block-oriented postfix for? I don't know, man. Shut up. Like, take your own thread. This is this is about something else. That sometimes happens, but um, but not often. And usually, people these things are snipped. We say, right, that's a different topic. Let's talk about it another time. And sometimes nobody is willing to decide the debate. Right? There's there's two or three sides, and they're all talking for a while, and no one. It's see, and it, it goes on, and you need someone to say, this is what we're going to do. Um, this this came up on IRC just today. How to deprecate something from the core. First, have a huge mailing list flame war. Secondly, after no conclusive result, deprecate anyway. Um, I think this is exactly right. Um, we don't actually have huge flame wars. We have discussions. Sometimes there's too many people. Um, sometimes there's too many people for it to be an easy conversation. Um, I don't think there's usually too many people for it to be civil. I don't think it's usually a bad thing to have a lot of people. Building consensus is good. Sometimes you don't get consensus. And the correct action there is not to take no action and to leave it sitting on the table. It's for something to be done. 
Right. We all agree on the necessity of compromise, but we can't agree when to compromise. Well, another way to formulate this is we can't agree on the necessity when it's we all agree it's necessary to compromise, and I can tell you when we are going to compromise. Um, that, that's that's the, the thing that I think is one of the most important things I can be doing for the project. Um, I don't write a lot of code for the core. Um, but when we get these big discussions, the important thing is, first, the first important thing is to have the discussion. I really frown on these ideas of, um, I, wanna, I wanna do something with no discussion. I'm just gonna push a change into, into Perl, um, and, and if people don't like it, we'll, we can talk about it later. Um, for the most part, I think this, is, this establishes a bad culture. It puts, it puts committers on a different tier from other contributors. Um, we have a very limited number of contributors to Perl. Most people have to submit a patch and someone applies it. And I don't think it works well. So have the discussion. First, have the discussion. And secondly, end the discussion. And end it um, with, with a statement, right? Like, thank you, this has been a good discussion. We are now going to do what we all agreed on. Or, thank you, this was a good discussion. We are going to do this particular option. Or, we really can't tell what to do. We're gonna do more research off list and we'll revisit this later. Um, I have not always succeeded in doing these things. Um, I try, and when I fail, I hope people will politely uh, remind me that I failed and that we should get these things sorted. But to me, talking something to death is good as long as the death is an execution carried out in, uh, by intention, right? That we say, good, it's done, let's keep going. Um, okay. Questions about that, that whole section there, talking about that? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the comment was, if we could, if we could say, uh, uh, let's say automate, if we, if we could automatically or by regulation say, here's a change we're thinking about putting in, how much will it break, that would be awesome. It is awesome. Um, Stefan Muller has built a system for doing this. Um, it's, it's great and I love it. Unfortunately, um, it's a little tough to use. Um, just because like Stefan made it go, it's really fantastic, and he keeps saying, other people, please use this so that we can like figure out how to make it great, and everyone else says, yeah, I'll get around to it. And I'm, I'm super guilty of this. But we have a mechanism, and I really, really want it to get better. And maybe we can talk about, uh, as a community, some of you will volunteer to help make it better. Talk, send me an email or whatever. Um, that we can say, smoke all of CPAN at this commit, and I'm gonna merge some crazy changes in, and then smoke the whole CPAN again and tell me what's different. It has been super useful when we've used it, super useful. So yes, you're totally right. We've, we've done it, and it's great. Yeah, we tried it. We, yeah. Um, okay. Perl needs hackers. Um, so, why aren't why aren't we making like awesome? Why haven't you added this to Perl? Why does Perl still have this stupid feature? Why are exceptions still strings? Why is like uh, a lot of the time? It's not that we don't want to change. It's not that we want not to change. It's not that we want to stay the same. It's that we don't have a patch. Um, I have written two. I think two patches to the Perl C code. Um, one of them added a warning, so I'm sorry. Um, the other one, I'm gonna mention this because it is one of my favorite changes in 5.18 and maybe none of you will care. On, on non-Windows in 5.16 and earlier, what happens if you run Perl space directory name? Anyone? It does nothing, it exits zero. In Perl 5.18, it will exit non-zero and give you a warning. God, I love that. Because um, I, always, I always write Perl-I lib lib program, right? And it tries, it's like, oh, lib's a directory, whatevs, it's cool. Um, right, and the reason that that got fixed is that I just lost it, I couldn't take it anymore. Somebody, somebody brought up this problem and, um, and I was motivated enough by this problem, which I had every day 
to go look at the source and fix it. Now, the reason I pick something so easy is that I am a miserable C programmer. I think that patch went through like five iterations um, before it like worked. Um, and it was, it was like a two-line, it's a two-line patch. Um, but, but I did it because I really, really wanted to fix stuff. So people who really, really want to fix stuff should, should send patches. Because if you have heard that we will talk you to death, we won't. We'll have a conversation with you. It'll be awesome. Um, if you've heard that we don't, that we want to not change, it's not true. I like changing. I think that Perl can keep getting more Perlish and more awesome. It's going to be great. Um, send us patches. It's, you'll have a good time. We'll have a good time. Um, I'll give you a nickel for, for, I don't know, a patch, maybe. I, I don't have that many nickels. Um, How about wooden nickels? Wooden nickels. Well, yeah, somebody pick me up a whole bunch of wooden nickels and keep them at your house for me, and, <laughs> and we'll do that. Um, most of our patches, um, more than half, like two-thirds of our patches, come from four people, four committers. Uh, of the remaining 30-some percent, uh, many of them are, are not, they're not features, they're, they're tiny bug fixes, um, documentation fixes, really good stuff. Like, I love documentation fixes. I love, in the last year, 1% of the commits in Perl 5 were made by uh, this guy whose name I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm not going to say it. Look him up. He's, he's in the, the charts. David, who submitted so many typo fixes that he is responsible for 1% of the commits. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, David Steinberg, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> those are great, but like things that are adding features or, or, uh, or really uh, rejiggering the code, um, we don't have a lot of those coming in. And Perl is not dead, right? I, if I was going to write almost, almost anything these days, I would start in Perl. Like there's some, some domains where I wouldn't, but, oh, but Perl's great. People write new stuff in it all the time. It's fantastic. And anyone who says that people aren't writing Perl is insane. Like the argument that nobody, who writes stuff in Perl anymore? Dude, I, like everybody, everybody writes stuff in Perl. But um, Perl.c is kind of on life support right now. And I think it's because there's a division between the people who are writing everything in Perl and the people who are writing Perl itself. There's not enough people who come in and work on stuff. And yeah, okay, it's Jenga, right? Like the Perl code base, is, it's nasty. Um, but we can make it less nasty, a little less nasty. We can still make changes inside the nasty code base. Like people should come and participate and we'll get that number up, right? Most of our patches will come from six people, eight people, 10 people. Eventually it would be a stupid bullet point because the commit list will be, you know, all these little, little boxes that aren't worth dividing into these four and everybody else. Um, everybody in this room is a doctor in the sense if Perl's on life support. You're all programmers, just about. Like maybe you don't write a lot of C. Well, you can learn C. And if you don't want to learn C, you can work on other stuff that's in the Perl core. And if you don't want to learn other stuff that's in the Perl core, you can tell us what stuff have you been writing in Perl that is really busted because of some Perl behavior that could be fixed or could be extended. You can tell us what does the Perl level, what does Perl space need from Perl.c to get better. But the best thing you can do is write patches to give us that, for reals. Um, Perl hackers need code review. <clears throat> uh, people, who are, yeah, people who are sending us patches uh, are not often enough getting feedback on their patches. This is a tough problem. Um, I don't know what we're going to do about this. Uh, I, I really don't. We have a, a limited number of people who can provide this review. And they're, they're doing review. Um, maybe they could do more review, which means maybe they could fix less stuff in Perl. And that's not saying one of those is better than the other. They're, they're, that's a tough choice. And if we're going to get new committers, new contributors, those people need code review. And <clears throat> the people who get that code review, at least some of them need to stick around and do more code review. That's how we have to, to build a community of maintainers and contributors and, and engineers for the Perl core. Um, okay, um, we have one and a half minutes for me to tell you all my hopes and dreams. Okay, so it's gonna be pretty fast. Um, <clears throat> these are things I wanna see happen in the next release or two of Perl. Um, if you give patches for these and the patches are good, I will give you uh, a lot of nickels and a high five and Sawyer will give you a hug. Um, <clears throat> okay. 
Fatal implicit close, right? If you have some file handle and you fall off the end, if the close fails right now, nothing happens. That should be fatal. You, this is like lexical file handles, the, the anonymous file handles in a lexical variable, or whatever you want to call them. Um, they're great because they auto close, and they're terrible because the auto close throws away any error condition. Ah! This needs to get fixed. Post fix dereferencing. Okay, this, this one, I will. Oh my god, okay. <clears throat> so, everybody hates Perl's dereferencing syntax. A ton. Everyone hates it. So, how, did, how do we try to fix this? Well, we added. We added auto dereferencing, right? So you don't have to put that on there, which is okay. But it only works in some contexts. And there are other problems. You can't at compile time know that you're asserting this thing is an array reference uh, in the same way because there's no sigil in place. What if you could say this, right? Still read your dereferencing left to right. Please don't focus on which sigils I chose for the love of God. Um, <clears throat> read things from left to right, and at the end you say, and then get the array out of its array reference. Then you could even use it on the right side. Instead of pushing something that was in a list, which you can't do now with auto dereferencing, it has to be the left argument, you could do this. Or if you had a scalar reference, you could you know, dereference it as a scalar, like that. Or if you had a glob reference, oh, oh maybe not. Um, <clears throat> real exceptions. Who doesn't want non-string exceptions in corporal? Who wants us to stick with strings forever? Which of you are trolling? Okay, um, wouldn't this be great? Yes. Um, better types, I'm going over, I'm going to finish really, really soon. Better types, yes, like character versus byte. Strings versus buffs. If I ever switch all of my code to Perl 6, it will be because they have distinct strings and buffers. Oh my gosh. Unbelievably important and good. Can we get stuff like this into Perl 5? Maybe. Maybe. We should figure it out. Um, Autoboxing, I don't know if we can do this uh, in, a, in a way that's going to be great for everybody, but like autoboxing, autoboxing is good. Somebody's saying no, well, yeah, oh, it's Chip. Chip is, say Chip is saying no to something? Amazing. <laughs> no, I mean, autoboxing auto -boxing has big problems. Like, can it be done? Maybe. It's, can it be done? Maybe. Should it be done? Maybe. But it should be investigated, and we should document our findings. We've been very bad at that. Um, MRO magic. We need, we need magic MRO. If you don't know what it is, uh, search for magic MRO RJBS advent. Um, it is a feature that will make many things, including a meta object protocol, much easier in Perl. Okay. We have negative one and a half minutes. Who has a question? Yes, the blue shirt. How do I convince admins to upgrade? How do you convince admins to upgrade? Buy them beer. The first thing you do is buy them beer. Uh, or whatever drink they prefer. The second thing you do is to show them the delta, show them all the bugs that are fixed. The third thing you do is that when they're drinking the beer, you drop in uh, some kind of sedative and you upgrade while they're out. Um, yeah, yeah, well, no, no, yes. I hope that was a joke. Uh, okay, next. Uh, Right, so the question is how do we, tell me if this is the question, the question is how do we take something experimental and say it's not experimental anymore? Um, well, the, the, there's two answers to that. One is we take away the warning and we take it out of the experimental document, but that's not, that's not the interesting answer. Um, the interesting answer is that after we have an experimental feature, we need to have acceptance criteria for it. Um, we don't have those for our current experimental features. I think that's okay. You can start an experiment without knowing whether or not you're going to, how you're going to accept it. Some of these, for some of these features, it's clear. The acceptance criteria for lexical subroutines is going to mostly, I think, be related to the bugs are gone. The obvious bugs are gone. It's working. Things for like lexical topic, the acceptance criteria are going to be something like it's less confusing. But we need to establish those. And we need to establish those, review them, and when we say that they have been reviewed and we're happy with them, we take off the warning, we, t we put in an announcement that it's not experimental anymore, and I talk about it in my talk the next year. Uh, Mark. What's okay? There's two answers to that. 
One is, which is the document for new contributors working on the core? Perl Hack Toot? Yeah, I think so. There's a couple Perl docs. I think the one you want is Perl Hack Toot, which is like, hey, I want to hack on Perl. What do I need to do? Um, there's a bunch of these kind of documents. There's Perl Hack, Perl Hack Toot, Perl, hack, Perl Repo, Perl Git. I think Perl Hack Toot is the one you want. Uh, I haven't had to read it in a while, and it's, it's, it's shameful that I don't know the answer to tell you, because uh, I should be able to tell anybody who asks me, and I'll find it out for the next guy. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the other thing is, how do you learn the internals? I don't know. I think the answer is, you start by trying to figure stuff out. You talk to people on, on P5P, be it the IRC channel or the mailing list. And unfortunately right now, this will involve some amount of convincing them you're for real. By which I mean, I am working on doing this. I know I have to start with X. I've done that much legwork. How much does X have to be? Not much. I've done a little work. I need to do something in this file to get started. Can you tell me on any amount of information? Um, once we have more experts, or not even experts, once we have more people who know anything <laughs> about the core and who are willing to give review, this will become very easy. I want to do something. Where do I look for that in here? Great, I'll go do something, and it's going to become a, a rapid feedback cycle. Right now, this feedback cycle is not rapid. It's slow and erratic, and that's really bad. And that's something we need to fix, and the way we fix it is by getting more and more people working on it. Um, uh, we're running late. I don't know what's going on now, so if, if I need to shut up, I will. If there are more questions, I'll answer them otherwise. I, I love you guys too. I love everybody here. <clears throat>